Hi, welcome to another episode of MYD Global. I'm your host, Leanne hackman Cardi. Every once in a while, I get to interview some fantastic visionaries. Today's episode, I'm speaking with Tande Mwape Veladsen. She's a humanitarian diplomacy expert, and in particular, she's done a ton of work in the area of disaster risk reduction. So stay tuned as I talk with Tande about the work she's doing and how she is really making a difference, not only in Africa, but in Asia, Latin America, and other places around the world. Hi, Tandy. How are you? Great. I'm doing great. Thank you, Leanne. And yourself? I'm good. I'm good. So before we get started, can you just tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Okay, so Tandy. Tandy is a Zambian. I have lived in, I think, eight countries. I can't keep up any any longer. Um, And yes, I work in uh, humanitarian diplomacy, which is really about lobbying and advocating for people who are most vulnerable to climate risks and um, also exposed to a lot of um, risks to uh, natural hazards, uh, disasters, as, 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 as we call them often. I trained as a journalist in my younger days, and then I transitioned um, to focus a lot more on international peace and security, and then transitioned into development work, uh, focusing mainly on disaster risk reduction um, from a climate change and um, environmental perspective. And Tandy is also a mother, and I love running. Uh, it's one of my, uh, my passions in life, really. I, I love to be outdoors. And uh, that connects me to nature and the work that I do uh, primarily. Hopefully that's uh, enough of a short intro. Yeah, no, that's great. So, so tell me, wh- when did you first get involved in this whole area of disaster risk reduction? Disaster risk reduction. So as I said earlier, I had trained as a journalist and I'd focused a lot of my early um, on career on political and conflict resolution from a reporting perspective. I joined the United Nations when I was about 24 and I moved to East Timor, completely strange environment, totally different um, from what I had been used to as as, as a Zambian young girl. And there I got a lot um, exposed to issues of disaster risk management. It was mainly a political mission. So you're working mainly on issues of transitional justice political transformation of um, that small island state. But there was also a lot of issues to do with poverty um, and vulnerability to um, natural natural hazards, um, risks. So from there, I started to get um, quite a keen interest. Um, When I moved from East Timor, I moved to Kosovo, another political environment, but had to do a lot with trying to minimize risks that people face, risks from conflict, and from conflict as well are other issues that normally um, these environments face. So while people are maybe embroiled in um, inter-ethnic conflict as, as, as they were referred to in Kosovo, for example, there were other issues that communities were facing. Issues to do with climate risks, whether it was severe winters and, and, and cold storms, whether it was in the summer and it was hot, and the whole um, conversation around climate change started gaining a lot of momentum. That was around 2003, 2005, when I worked in, in those contexts. And then the major one happened when I moved to Pakistan, when the earthquake had happened um, in 2005. And that's where you saw a real crisis, real vulnerability, real suffering. And from then on, I shifted um, to focus a lot more into working with governments, working with private sector, working with communities at the local level to focus a lot more on how do we ensure that we are preparing communities to be better prepared so that when disasters strike, they are in situations that make them um, better positioned to bounce back from those disasters that that they face. And so I I, I moved from um, my journalism reporting information analysis focus and started um, some different courses on sustainable development with University of London 
And then the transition has now happened um, with um, further degrees and master degree levels of studies in international relations and negotiation, which is quite critical in the field that I work in to work with different stakeholders and, and find, find common grounds on what, um, what, what agenda you're trying to push as regards to issues on um, climate negotiations, um, mitigation and adaptation, um, as well as working with the private sector, which is um, a huge um, stakeholder group that we need to work with on uh, reducing risks as um, relates to development and investments. Yeah, so you've seen obviously through your career a lot of different types of disasters, whether they're conflict related, whether they're natural disasters. Um, just curious as far as some of the solutions you're, you know, you, you, we, I think increasingly countries are looking at uh, disaster risk reduction as a strategy they have to implement, but what are some of the best practices, some tangible things that you think people could be doing? I, I like that uh, question, uh, Leanne, because I think a lot of um, the complexities we find in, in our world is, is, is around technicalities, a lot of bureaucratic processes that um, tend to, uh, tend, they do tend to hold us back from making real impact sometimes um, on the ground where impact really is seen, whether it's um, improvement in people's lives, whether it's a real exposure to, to disasters and to risks. So the question is very pertinent, especially in today's context. The, the International Federation of the Red Cross just released um, what's called the World Disasters Report yesterday. And what that report is saying is, is putting an emphasis on the need for action, which is exactly what you're asking. And what we work on as a Red Cross movement is really anchoring our responses and our strategies, our thinking in community-led initiatives. We see communities, the people that are most at risk to uh, climate risks in this uh, context that we're speaking of, we see people on the ground as being core partners. So we don't see them as beneficiaries, that language we've really tried to fade it out of our thinking and our conversations. The people that are at the front line of facing risks are our partners in how we develop solutions to the issues that the world is facing, whether it's poverty, whether it's conflict, whether it's um, issues of natural hazards as, as you've described, um, tsunamis, floods, droughts the people themselves need to be brought to the table to make sure that we understand how they perceive these risks. And we try to combine traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge with what science is telling us so that the two worlds can actually come together and we find common grounds in how the scientific world is viewing um, certain concepts and how traditional knowledge is also coming together and understanding the context that they live in and the solutions that they themselves think are tangible in those particular contexts. And so some of the great examples um, for me really lie from, from the alliance that I represent, Partners for Resilience, which is spread across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and we've got our global headquarters um, in the Netherlands. What we have done in the last 10 years is partner strongly with communities, civil society organizations that are anchored within communities. We work strongly with them to come to the table, do our situational analysis, our context analysis to say, okay, this is what it's looking at. This is what it's looking like. And science is telling us this. What do you guys think is the way we should address some of these problems that are coming up? Of course, there will be some you know, technological um, innovations that some communities might not be privy to that we bring along in our conversations but we work mainly with the knowledge of communities to ensure that whatever worlds we are bringing together actually understand each other, but also I show respect to our local knowledge because I think science is also showing us quite strongly that a lot of the indigenous practices in either managing our forests, managing nature, interacting with nature, those have actually proven quite effective in how land re is restored, how land is looked after. So bringing those two worlds together and devising uh, solutions jointly 
is one of the strongest assets that I found from an, an alliance like Partners for Resilience. And so working with, for example, traditional royal houses, um, Uganda gives us such a perfect example where we have connected as a network of African women environmentalists to what, um, what is called the traditional royal houses of Uganda. It's called the Buganda Kingdom. And there are some amazing examples of where we've seen traditional knowledge, combining it with science, working with the meteorological departments, but ensuring that that aspect of traditional life is not totally thrown uh, to the sidelines. Working with that kind of knowledge to look at how communities can adapt their livelihoods because our climate is changing. So certain, for example, crops that have been grown in the past are not sustainable anymore because it's just gotten too hot. The rain patterns have changed, they're erratic, or when it does rain, it's flooding. So some of those crops are not sustainable anymore. So combining how communities are viewing their changing climate, combining that with the science and what it's telling us in terms of predictions for weather forecast and what it means, and, and combining those to bringing them together and finding joint solutions is one of the most effective ways that I think um, are working um, at the moment in addressing some of these uh, natural hazards and, and the impacts that they have on uh, local communities. I think that's great. And it's a great model because, you know, I, I think the worst thing we can do is just blame somebody else for our problems and then do nothing. In this case, you're empowering and engaging them and saying, you are the solution, you know, and, and, and figuring out what can be done and how things can change. I think that's, that's how you get change. Um, and um, may I just add, I, 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 again, I like um, that, that, that emphasis on ensuring that we're partnering with the local communities. And, and there's different demographics in there that we have to obviously pay attention to, whether we're in Asia, whether it's in Africa, Latin America, the role of women has to be recognized. I mean, the African context is, is, is quite known for seeing women as being naturers of, of, of nature. So when they are excluded from processes that require them to contribute to solutions, you are actually impacting how solutions are found and how programs are implemented. Mm -hmm. Now, we also know that the social system has changed so much over the years that women have actually been sidelined from decision-making um, places. So that's where we actually came in as a network of women environmentalists, uh, drawing from expertise from UN Environment. We've got the Climate Center uh, Technology in Denmark that has joined the center. We work with food and, and agriculture organization, but we also go beyond just talking to each other as women. We try to feed on what the young people are doing. We've got amazing entrepreneurs um, across um, Africa that are doing incredible work on land restoration. And what we've been pushing is the notion that everything that's relating to disaster risk reduction, and for as much as it connects to protecting the environment, it has to be seen from the purview of livelihoods and job creation. So it's no longer about charity and aid and, 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 and writing project proposals, but it has to be linked to the very survival of, of human beings, the very survival of people, linking it to how they are making a living. And so we've seen incredible examples of young people starting to work on forest restoration, growing seedlings to plant as trees, but they're making a living out of it. And those are kind, I think those are the kind of innovations we want to see brought to scale. They need to be amplified. They need to be supported further because maybe they're happening at a small scale. But I think if we start to look at the concept of risk reduction actually as, as, as a way of providing livelihoods for communities, it starts to make sense as well, because then people are not also seated, you know, folding their arms and waiting for some NGO to come and swoop in and, and provide uh, solutions, but to engage them and make it um, a sustainable way of, um, of, of supporting their lives as well. Yeah, no, that's great. So before we wrap up, is there anything else that maybe you wanted to mention that I haven't asked about? No, actually, I think, um, of course, our conversation is short and there's always so much to say in, in, in these uh, discussions on risk reduction. Um, I did want to put an emphasis, I think, uh, from where we started from talking about partnering with local communities. With what COVID-19 um, pandemic has exposed in, in the way the humanitarian system is set up, 
is really the shift of, 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 of power. What we've seen is that um, the restrictions that came about because you know people could not fly, you could not hold physical meetings, that power has actually shifted more to local institutions. But then there's also um, a very huge power imbalance in terms of how resources are distributed in the development sector. So often you find that local organizations don't have the, the right access to financial resources. We just uh, saw in the report that's been released by the Red Cross yesterday that still uh, finances relating to climate change and adaptation initiatives are still not reaching enough local organizations. So that's quite a concern at the moment. I think the, the voices are there. There's a lot of advocacy around it. And I think the international community does need to rally around that message of ensuring that what we are calling the localization agenda, ensuring that local organizations are the ones that are driving the change, that are driving um, implementation of programs, that that power shift starts to happen in the real sense of the way finances are also dis distributed across the board. So that's something that I would really want to see um, happen a lot more. And of course, the aspect of governments and their leadership to take ownership of the issues that are happening within their countries. And it just doesn't end within countries, actually. Everybody knows now that climate change and its impact has no boundaries, it has no borders. So that conversation at cross-country level, transboundary level, has to also intensify to ensure that I think um, understanding that if I'm safe and my neighbor is not safe, it makes a whole society actually quite unsafe to be, uh, to be in. And that's what COVID has actually revealed again. So I think solidarity in organizing ourselves is important and moving forward uh, will require that, that we look beyond the confines of our boundaries to ensure that we're really tapping into each other's, um, it, it, each other's strengths, but also understanding that the weaknesses that surround us ultimately impact us as um, individual and sovereign states as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your perspective. It certainly is unique. I mean, your, your background has given you such a global perspective on what's happening. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time and wish you all the best in your work. Thank you so much, Lee, and it was a pleasure. And I do hope we do get to talk sometime soon again, and we can uh, take the conversation further, I guess, and look at more of the opportunities that are out there for us to advance work on uh, climate change. It's really the biggest threat that humanity is facing right now. So when you add poverty, insecurity, and health pandemics, it makes um, our world even more complex uh, to live in. So hopefully we can take these conversations forward soon. Oh, I would like that. Take care. Thank you, Leanne.